Chapter 1, Part 1 of Explorers and Travelers by Adolphus W. Greeley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. Chapter 1, Part 1, Louis Joliet, Rediscoverer of the Mississippi. If one should ask which is the most important river basin in the world, there is no doubt that the Mississippi would be named with its million and a quarter square miles of area and its twenty-five or more billions of aggregated wealth favored in climate soil and navigable streams and endowed with practically inexhaustible veins of coal copper iron and silver feeding the world with its hundreds of millions of bushels of corn and wheat and clothing it by other millions of bales of cotton it is hardly so astonishing that within two hundred seventeen years from its discovery by joliet this greatest of river basins should be the abiding place of twenty seven and a half millions of people speaking of joliet bancroft wrote that his short voyage brought him immortality but in the irony of fate his explorations have not even given his name a place in the last edition of the encyclopedia britannica in writing on american explorers it seems most fitting that this series of sketches should be headed by this canadian whose name is scarcely known by one in a thousand that aught is obtainable concerning the details of his life is due to the investigations of Shea, which later were admirably summed up by Parkman. Louis Joliet, the son of John Joliet and Mary d'Abancourt, was born at Quebec, September 21, 1645. His father was a wagon maker in the service of the company of 100 associates, then owners of Canada. The son in youth was imbued with devout feelings which possibly fostered by the elder Joliet as certain to bring station and influence in manhood, led to his being educated in the Jesuit College for the Priesthood, in which, indeed, he received the minor orders in 1662. Four years later, in the debates on philosophy, which were participated in by the intendant and listened to by the colonial dignitaries, Joliet showed such skill as to elicit a special commendation from the fathers. His future career shows that his studies with the fathers were not lost on him, and doubtless they contributed largely to make Joliet that intelligent, well-poised leader who filled with credit all duties and positions incident to his varied and adventurous life. It is probable, however, that during all these years he was at heart a true voyager, and that his thoughts turned continually from the cloister and books to the forest and its attractive life. Be this as it may, he practically abandoned all ideas of the priesthood at the age of twenty-two, and turned to the most certain, and indeed, in Canada, the only path to wealth, that of a trader in furs with the Indians. In this trade, only the hardy, shrewd, intelligent, and tireless subordinate could hope to thrive and rise. Success meant long and hazardous journeys into the very heart of the Indian country where were needed great physical courage and strength, perfect skill with gun, paddle, axe, sledge, or snowshoe, a thorough knowledge of woodcraft, indomitable will or casuistry, and tact according to the occasion. To paddle a canoe from sunrise to sunset of a summer day, to follow the sledge or break a snowshoe path before it as far as a dog can travel in a march, to track a moose or deer for leagues without rest, to carry canoes and heavy packs over long portages through an untraveled country, were the ordinary experiences of a voyager, which were accomplished for the great part on a diet of smoked meat and boiled Indian corn, with no shelter in fair weather and the cover of an upturned canoe or bark hut in stress of storm. Joliet did not long remain in private adventure for in 1669 Talon, then intendant of Canada, sent him to discover and explore the copper mines of Lake Superior, in which quest he failed. It was on his return trip that Joliet met with La Salle and the priests of Dolier and Galinay on September 24, 1669, near the present town of Hamilton, in which direction Joliet's Indian guide had misled him when returning from Lake Erie, through fear of meeting enemies at the niagara portage joliet's facility for map-making in the field is evident from the fact that at this time he showed to the priests with la salle a copy of the map that he had made of such parts of the upper lakes as he had visited and gave them a copy of it 
He, moreover, evidenced continued interest in religious matters by telling them that the Potawatomis and other Indian tribes of that region were in serious need of spiritual succor. La Salle, later, in November 1680, repaid this frank tender of information of the little-known West by intimating his belief that Joliet never went but little south of the mouth of the Illinois, and is also stated to have declared that Joliet was an impostor. In his account of La Salle's last journey, Father Douay, referring to Joliet's discoveries as related by Marquette, says, I have brought with me the printed book of this pretended discovery, and I remarked all along my route that there was not a word of truth in it. The efforts to deprive Joliet of the credit of the original discovery of the Mississippi falls before the dispatch of Count Frontenac to Colbert, then minister, dated Quebec, November 14, 1674. 6. Sir Joliet whom M. Talon advised me, on my arrival from France, to despatch for the discovery of the South Sea, has returned three months ago, and discovered some very fine country, and a navigation so easy through the beautiful rivers he has found, that a person can go from Lake Ontario and Fort Frontenac in a bark to the Gulf of Mexico, there being only one carrying place, half a league in length, where Lake Ontario communicates with Lake Erie. He has been within ten days of the Gulf of Mexico. I send you by my secretary the map he has made of it. He has lost all his minutes and journals in the shipwreck he suffered in sight of Montreal. He left with the fathers at Sault Ste. Marie copies of his journal. But to return to the circumstances under which Joliet made the voyage. Among other orders of Louis the Fourteenth regarding Canada was a charge to discover the South Sea and Mississippi and jean talon intendant of canada lost no chance of furthering this object la salle's journey of sixteen seventy had failed to reach the great river though he descended the ohio to the falls at louisville and at his recall in sixteen seventy two talon had the subject of further exploration in hand joliet had lately returned from his unsuccessful efforts to discover copper mines on lake superior during which he had probably been the first white man to pass through the straits of detroit despite his late failure he had impressed talon as the man best fitted to lead such an expedition and so before sailing for france the intendant recommended joliet for the work to count frontenac the new governor in those days the church and government went hand in hand and but few french expeditions went westward from montreal without a priest to carry the faith to such indian tribes as were allies of france or liable to be won over as joliet's priest associate james marquette a young jesuit then a missionary at st esprit la pointe lake superior was chosen no better man could have been sent marquette was in the prime of life an expert linguist as he had learned in six years to speak fluently six indian languages gentle patient and tactful with the natives devout in faith singularly holy in life fearless, imaginative, nature-loving, and observant, as shown by his journal, which, owing to Joliet's shipwreck, is the only original story of the voyage. His enthusiasm is shown by the opening sentences of his journal. I have obtained from God the favor of being enabled to visit the nations on the Mississippi River, and find myself in the happy necessity of exposing my life for the salvation of all these tribes, especially the Illinois. Joliet followed the St. Lawrence to Fort Frontenac, at the entrance of Lake Ontario, and, with the exception of the portage at the Falls of Niagara, skirted in his canoe the shores of the Great Lakes until he reached the Straits of Mackinac, on the north side of which, at Point St. Ignace, he found the enthusiastic Marquette devotedly laboring for the spiritual welfare of the Hurons and Ottawans there gathered. The contemplated line of travel was that of Jean Nicolet, an interpreter who had spent many years with the Indian tribes, who was sent in 1638 to bring about a peace between the Hurons and Winnebagoes who lived near Green Bay. After his negotiations, he ascended the Fox River, and, making a portage to the Wisconsin, descended that stream some distance, so that, as he thought, from the designation of the great water by the Indian guide to the Mississippi, he was within three days of the South Sea. 
Joliet, however, was too practical to trust entirely to tradition or oral description. He had already carefully charted all that was definitely known of the western lake regions, and now at St. Ignace, with Marquette's invaluable assistance, gathered all possible information from such Indians at the mission as had frequented the unknown country. This information being duly weighed and considered, Joliet extended his map to cover all the new country, marking thereon the navigable rivers, the names of nations and villages along their proposed route, the course of the great river, and other useful information. Their means of subsistence and travel were the simplest imaginable, two canoes and as large quantities of smoked meat and Indian corn as could be conveniently carried. Their canoes were of the usual Canadian pattern, of birch bark covering, stayed with spruce root ribs and cedar splint, with white pine pitch smeared over the birch bark joints so as to render them watertight. Such canoes were of astonishing strength and carrying capacity, and of such lightness that four men could carry the largest across portages. On a bright spring morning, May 17th, Joliet and Marquette, with five other men, left behind them the palisaded post and chapel of St. Ignace. Plying briskly their paddles from sunrise to sunset, they made rapid progress, coasting the lake shore until they turned aside to visit the Menominees, or Wild Rice Indians, whose village was on the river of that same name. Here, inquiries for information of the great river brought from the savage allies strenuous efforts to dissuade them from visiting this Mississippi, where, they said, the unsparing ferocity of the tribes brought unfailing death by the tomahawk to even inoffensive strangers, and that war now raged among the intervening nations. They further recited the dangers of navigating the rapids of the great river the presence of frightful water monsters who swallowed up men and canoes the roaring demon who engulfed all travellers and lastly the existence of such excessive heat as to ensure certain death after religious instruction and service the explorers embarked in their canoes and soon reached the southern extremity of green bay where says marquette our fathers labor successfully in the conversion of these tribes having baptized more than two thousand Joliet from Green Bay entered Fox River, finding it a gentle, beautiful stream, promising easy and pleasant passage, and abounding in wild fowl. Soon, however, these agreeable aspects gave way to the sterner phases of exploration, for sharp rapids were fallen in with where the strong and uncertain cross-currents often threatened the total destruction of their frail canoes, which would have proved fatal to their plans by dashing them against the sharp boulders. A serious but lesser evil to these enduring voyagers was the injury to their moccasin-shod feet, which were cut and bruised by the sharp edges of the rocky bed of the river, over which they slowly and painfully dragged their canoes for long distances. The many rapids were safely passed, and on the 7th of June, 1673, our explorers reached an Indian town which marked the extreme western limits of French discoveries being the furthest point reached by nicolette in his adventurous journey in this town dwelt bands from three different tribes the miamis mascoutins or fire nation and kickapoos the latter two were inferior in manners and appearance to the miamis who more civil liberal and well made wore two long earlocks that marquette thought becoming besides they were reputed warriors who rarely failed in their forays they proved docile attentive and interested in religious matters as was shown not only by their talk with father alouez but also by a cross standing in the centre of the town which was adorned with votive offerings of skins belts bows and arrows to the great manitou for an abundance of game during the dreaded famine time of winter the indians used for their beds mats probably made of rushes, which in default of bark also served as material for the walls and roofs of their unsubstantial shelters. Since Marquette refers to the advantage of such building material as capable of being rolled up and easily moved during hunts, it is probable that this town was of a temporary character. It appears to have been well located, being on an eminence, whence the approach of an enemy or the presence of game could be readily observed in the open country. Marquette says of it, The view is beautiful and very picturesque, 
for from the eminence on which it is perched are seen stretching out on every side as far as i can reach prairies broken by thickets or groves of lofty trees the indians grew much corn and gathered wild plums and grapes from which his thoughts turning to home he says good wine could be made if they chose joliet lost no time but immediately on arrival assembled the sachems and told them that he was sent by his governor to discover new countries he made them a present and asked that two guides be sent to show him the way which resulted in the gift of joliet of a mat to serve as a bed and the sending of two miamis as guides the next day june tenth they proceeded two miamis and seven frenchmen in two canoes up the river to the portage through a network of marshes little lakes and meandering channels so hidden by the wild rice that their guides were very useful conducting joliet to a portage of twenty seven hundred paces and assisting in the transportation of the canoes across it the miamis then returned leaving the explorers alone in an unknown country in the hands of providence before launching their canoes into strange waters which were to bear them into unknown lands they knelt on the bank and offered up devout aspirations to god for continued success the new river was the wescousing wisconsin whose broad shallows and sandy bottom while rendering navigation slow and very laborious yet contrasted delightfully with the rocky rapids of the fox father marquette sets forth delightfully the ideal voyage down this stream past vine-clad islets along sloping banks now bordered by the lovely prairie with its sweet odors of fresh grasses and blooming flowers and anon fringed by the primeval forest beautiful with its tangle of shrubbery and in its june foliage the gnarled oak the straight walnut the elegant white wood and other stately trees of unknown species met their vision at times while again their eyes scarcely separated from the heavens the distant horizon of the green level plains whose luxuriant vegetation afforded the richest pasturage for numerous herds of deer and moose and in spots showed the fertility of its alluvial soil by the fields of indian corn each morning before they relaunched their canoes they attuned their voices to the praise of god and in their unique joy of successful discovery must have felt on those delightful june days that their devotions had not been uplifted in vain from sunrise to sunset they labored unceasingly now paddling briskly along the deep reaches and then struggling stoutly through mazes of shallows and sandbars where tedious and frequent portages were patiently made each evening their hearts rejoiced and their tired limbs found delightful repose at some spot where juliet's judgment directed the canoes to be drawn out inspected and upturned by some while others started the campfire and prepared the evening meal this camp was always so placed that the approach of an enemy could be seen from afar and where fuel for fire and branches for bedding were at hand the best hunter was told off for game and rarely did the meal lack fresh meat or fruit and berries in season after supper the soothing pipe prayers and songs of praise and then under the overarching trees such sound slumber as only comes to men sleeping under the open sky as they advanced it was often possible to use sail and relieve the men to some extent from their fatigue of the paddle and such rapid progress was made that on june seventeenth they safely entered the long-desired mississippi with a joy writes marquette which i cannot express they were then in latitude forty three degrees three minutes north opposite the site of the present city of prairie du chien turning eagerly southward their progress facilitated by the gentle current of the mississippi they journeyed more than a hundred leagues without seeing on the land aught save birds and beasts the solitude of the great river appalled them a vast torrent of rolling water bordered by forest and plain so well fitted for the happiness of man and yet no human being in all this land what could it mean and what would be the outcome joliet of long experience with savage tribes and astute in forest craft distrusted the silence and solitude and kept as keen guard as though on the warpath a tiny campfire was built only for meals and the nights were passed in the crowded canoes as far from shore as it was possible to anchor them in the deep river 
Even then, strict watch was kept, and every strange or unusual noise excited feelings of trepidation, lest a hidden foe be the cause. Their journey by day was not entirely devoid of incident and excitement, says Marquette. From time to time we met monstrous fishes, one of which struck the canoe so violently I took it for a large tree. Another time we perceived on the water a monster, probably an American tiger cat, with a head like a tiger and a pointed snout like the wild cat, with beard and ears erect, a grayish head and entirely black neck. They cast their nets successfully, and once caught a spade fish, whose appearance caused much astonishment. In 41 degrees 28 minutes north, latitude, near Rock Island, wild turkeys took the place of wild fowl, while, as to animals, only buffalo were seen, being so numerous and fearless as to be easily killed, and thus offering a welcome change of food. These new beasts presented themselves to our explorers as hideous, especially those with thick, long manes falling over their eyes in such tangles as to prevent their seeing clearly. Marquette records that the Indians tan buffalo skins into beautiful robes, which they paint into various colors, and further recites the ferocity of the buffalo as yearly causing the death of some Indian. When near the present city of Keokuk, at the mouth of the Des Moines River, on June 25th, they perceived the first signs of man in all this solitude footprints by the riverside, and then a beaten path which, entering a beautiful prairie, impressed them as leading to some Indian village. They had journeyed seventeen days without seeing the face of man, and so, after deliberation, they resolved to visit the village, this decision doubtless being urged by Marquette, who for years had sought by prayer to obtain of God the grace to be able to visit the nations on the river Mississippi and who now would allow no danger to deter him. Joliet was fully aware of the great risk, and took most careful precautions to ensure the safety of their canoes and people by charging them strictly to be aware of surprise, while he and Marquette ventured to put themselves at the discretion of an unknown savage people. Cautiously following the little path in silence across a beautiful prairie, and through the thickets for a distance of two leagues, they suddenly came in view of an Indian village, picturesquely placed on a river bank, and overlooked by two others on a neighboring hill. They pressed on with successful caution and silence, but with much doubt and fear. Having, as Marquette says, recommended ourselves to God with all our hearts, and, having implored his help, we passed on undiscovered and came so near we even heard the Indians talking. Stepping into the open, they halted and announced themselves by a loud cry, at which the Indians rushed out of their cabins, and recognizing them as French, and seeing a black gown, the well-known Indian name for a Jesuit, sent four of their chief warriors forward. Two chiefs, carrying calumets, or tobacco pipes, elaborately trimmed with various feathers, advanced very slowly and in silence, lifting their calumets as if offering them for the sun to smoke. Marquette, encouraged by their friendly attitude, and still more on seeing that they wore French cloth, broke the silence, to which the Indians answered that they were Illinois, who, in token of peace, presented their pipes to smoke and invited the strangers to their village. End of chapter one, part one. Recording by William Tomko.